he was born in California, United States. Although he has some Taiwanese origin, his parents are currently living in Taiwan and originally from Taiwan, I guess. So he got his first degree in physics from Cornell University and then uh, moved on to uh, Caltech for a PhD. So he finished his PhD in 2011 uh, from uh, Caltech and then moved on to uh, Canada working as a research fellow at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. And uh, in recent years, he specialized in numerical relativity, especially the dynamics and uh, space-time structure uh, around or off the black holes. So today, he's going to tell us about some numerical work uh, around the black hole. So uh, let's wait for him. Thank you for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me at the back. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the department uh, for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's a great honor for me. Uh, today, I will be talking about exploring black hole space times with numerical relativity. Um, on this first slide here, I'm just showing a few snapshots of uh, a typical numerical relativity simulation we do for two uh, black holes that orbit around each other and then collide to form a single black hole. So I'll talk more about uh, this problem later on. And uh, first of all, it, here's the outline of what I will be talking about. I'll first give some motivation um, for numerical relativity, why it's important, how it's connected to current um, experiments, um, the types of problems that it's able to handle, and I'll go uh, into more detail specifically for um, binary black holes, which is one of the uh, astrophysical problems that it can handle. And then I will talk about how numerical relativity can not only um, do those types of problems, but can also shed light on some uh, issues con and concepts that originate in mathematical relativity. And uh, if there's any part during the talk where um, something's not clear, please, please feel free to uh, stop me and ask me me to clarify. Uh, so here are just a few facts on black holes. <coughs> black holes are among the most strongly gravitating objects in nature, and they're described by Einstein's equations of general relativity. Uh, that being said, of course, there are uh, other theories of gravity, um, higher dimensional theories of gravity, quantum theories of gravity, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to stick to good old general relativity. <coughs> And they're formed from the collapse of matter, uh, like dying stars. And they act as energy sources uh, for astrophysical phenomena, such as uh, the formation of relativistic jets. And not only are uh, single black holes um, found in nature, but it's expected that binary black holes also exist. And for binary black holes, they orbit each other. So here's just a schematic picture binary black hole, and they orbit each other, as they orbit around each other, they emit gravitational waves, that is, ripples in the curvature of space-time that propagate away from these black holes. <coughs> and these gravitational waves, they emit uh, energy, they carry away energy as they propagate away from the black hole. This causes the orbits of the two black holes to shrink, and eventually they will collide with each other and form a final bigger black hole. And in that process, they will emit a bigger burst of gravitational waves. So in a binary, you typically have these parameters. Uh, if you have the black holes, it can have different sizes uh, defined by their masses and the spins of the two black holes. <coughs> so currently, there are um, experiments underway uh, to detect gravitational waves from binary black holes and other compact binaries. And one example is uh, called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And this is uh, based in the United States. There are two of these observatories. One is in Hanford, Washington. One is in Livingston, Louisiana. This picture shows what the interferometer looks like in uh, the Hanford site. So it basically consists of two very long arms in the shape of an L. So here's a schematic diagram of uh, LIGO. You have a laser beam that goes in. It gets split uh, and travels down the two arms. Each arm is very long, four kilometers. And at the end 
here, there are some mirrors. The laser beam bounced back, um, recombines, and normally if the two arm lengths remain the same, then these uh, light, light beams will just uh, interfere destructively and there will be no signal at the photo detector. But if a gravitational wave passes through, then the two arms will be squeezed and stretched by different amounts. And that change in the length here, delta L, is related to, well, it'll result in an interference per, uh, pattern detected by the photo detector. And that pattern is related to the strength of the gravitational waves uh, that pass through. And that's that I'm calling H on this slide. And um, the next generation of this uh, of LIGO, called Advanced LIGO, is expected to come online um, around 2015. And so this is a very exciting time in the community uh, for uh, because it's expected that if there are in fact binary black holes, then advanced LIGO will be able to detect them. And this will, would be then the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And there are also other detectors. Uh, one in Europe is called Virgo, and the other in Japan is called Kagra. So there's a catch, though. Um, because these astrophysical sources are very far away from us, by the time the gravitational wave signals reach, reach us, the, the, the amplitude of them, their amplitude is already very low. So the typical size of H of T is around 10 to the 21. So these signals are deeply buried in noise. Um, however, if we are able to model the binary black holes accurately, then we'll know, then we'll be able to predict what the gravitational waves that they emit look like. And this enables uh, data analysts to use a technique called matched filtering. So based on what uh, knowledge of what the signal should look like, they're able to use that knowledge to extract the signal out of all this noise. And to, to do that effectively, uh, one must construct a template bank of gravitational waveforms. So this is a large set of gravitational waveforms uh, for all the possible configurations of binary black holes. Uh, the different masses that each black hole can have, and the spins that black hole can have, uh, that each black hole can have, um, all give rise to different looking gravitational waveforms. And uh, we need to know um, how those look like to build a big enough template bank that we can, <clears throat> because we don't know astrophysically what uh, um, what we'll actually see first. So we need to cover those possibilities. So uh, traditional analytical techniques, they're good at treating the weak field regimes of gravity. So for example, there's uh, post-Newtonian theory, which is a weak field slow motion approximation to general relativity. And that's good for treating the early in spiral of the two black holes when the black holes are still very far apart and their interaction with each other is not very strong. And there's black hole perturbation theory that can treat the late ring down. So after these two black holes have already collided, merged together to form a single black hole, and at very late times, it'll settle down to some equilibrium geometry. And at those late times, um, the problem can basically be treated as just um, a curved black hole that weakly perturbed. So black hole perturbation theory is valid there. But in the intermediate stages, that is in the late in spiral, and right at the merger of the two black holes, analytical techniques, they're, um, well, they break down. And, it, and so uh, this is where numerical relativity comes in. Numerical relativity, or solving Einstein's equations on a computer, the full Einstein's equations on a computer, enable us to tackle this sort of problem. So we're able to treat gravity in a strong field and highly dynamical regime. Okay, so uh, this was some motivation uh, for numerical relativity, an example of the type of uh, problems it can um, tackle, binary black holes. 
And now I will go into some more details about how one actually does a numerical relativity simulation. So these are the familiar Einstein's equation, um, where I, uh, well, in numerical relativity, we typically use geometric units, in which the gravitational constant and the speed of light are set to unity. And to solve Einstein's equation on a computer, uh, what we typically do is we perform something called a 3 plus 1 split of space-time. <coughs> this figure is not showing up very well, but um, essentially the 3 plus 1 split of space-time is that we divide space-time up into a set of constant time spatial hypersurfaces, which I call sigma t on this slide. So this figure should show, um, so this is this, uh, this block here is our space time basically, and we divide it up into many different spatial hypersurfaces, one at each time, and a succession of sigma t's of spatial hypersurfaces make up our space time. And mathematically, this is expressed as uh, a decomposition of the space time metric, which is mu nu, and here, repeated indices are, are contracted. So I'm using the Einstein summation convention here. And mu nu are space time indices that go from 0 to 3. And ij are spatial indices going from 1 to 3. And we write the space time metric in terms of a spatial metric, gij. So this is the metric just on one of these sigma t uh, hypersurfaces. And there's also quantity n called a lapse function. This measures proper distance between uh, the hypersurfaces along a time-like unit normal n for the hypersurfaces. So um, this, if this is a hypersurface here, this is the time-like unit normal. And the last function measures the distance between this hypersurface to a next hypersurface. And we have a shift vector beta, and that determines how our coordinate labels move between the hypersurfaces. And in addition to this 3 plus 1 split of the space-time metric, and the spatial metric, and lapse and shift vector, we also define another quantity called the extrinsic curvature, which is minus 1 half the Lie derivative of the spatial metric along the time-like unit normal n for one of these spatial hypersurfaces. So, um, the equations are not too important at this time. I just want to, well, the key idea here is that we've defined this 3 plus 1 split of space time with these new quantities. And after we've done that, we can substitute these quantities like this and uh, the space time metric in this form, substitute that into the Einstein's equation. And this is what the Einstein equations become. Um, here, I'm just focusing on the vacuum case. Um, so if we're treating just black holes, the vacuum solution is the Einstein's equation. So we're just dealing with gravity here. Of course, we could include matter, but for simplicity, let's just look at vacuum. So if we define these 3 plus 1 quantities, substitute them back into Einstein's equations, Einstein's equations then split into a set of constraint <coughs> equations. So there's these equations. This is one equation. Uh, this is three equations here, called the Hamiltonian constraint, momentum constraint, and we have a set of evolution equations for the spatial metric, the extrinsic curvature. So these constraint equations need to be satisfied on some initial constant time hypersurface. And once we have um, a spatial metric and extrinsic curvature, that satisfy these constraint equations <coughs> on an initial hypersurface. We can then <coughs> evolve them forward in time using these evolution equations. So this decomposition into constraint and evolution equations is not unfamiliar to you because you've seen the same thing um, for Maxwell's equations in electromagnetism. We have constraint equations that the electric magnetic fields satisfy. And we have evolution equations for them. The uh, main difference is that you know, for Einstein's equations, they're nonlinear. <coughs> so they're a little messier to deal with. But here's
here are the basic steps that go into a numerical relativity simulation. Um, we solve the constraints to obtain what's called initial data. That is an initial snapshot of space-time on an initial hyper, uh, spatial hypersurface. And these, again, consist of essentially the spatial metric, extrinsic curvature, and the time derivatives, and the coordinate quantities last in the shift. And, uh, of course, we want to construct our initial data in a way that reflects the physical system that we're modeling. And doing that is not always trivial, uh, which I will also talk more about later. And in addition, once we have our initial data, we uh, evolve the Einstein evolution equations. And we need to do this, though, in a, in a form where the equations are well posed or hyperbolic. What this means is that if the constraints are satisfied at an initial time, since they remain satisfied at all times, um, however, well, and if they're not well posed, then if you have constraint uh, violation, a violation of the constraints um, at, in your initial data, even if they're small, they could grow very fast once you evolve that initial data. And this, um, well, so the evolution equations that I showed you before, these are actually not well posed. And this has caused uh, a big problem in the past uh, for trying to evolve Einstein's equations. And a lot of extensive research has been done to find ways to formulate the, these equations in a well posed form. Um, the, the, formula, the particular formulation that um, that my collaborators, my collaborators and I use uh, is called the generalized harmonic formulation. And in addition to dealing with this well posedness issue, we also have to determine the coordinates that we use. They're usually dynamical coordinates that we use because in general relativity we have this coordinate freedom. And we have to fix that freedom in order to actually do our calculations. It is analogous to fixing the gauge conditions for the scalar and vector potentials in electromagnetism. So here are uh, some details about the actual code that uh, I use. It's called the Spectral Einstein Code, or SPEC for short. And it's developed um, by a collaboration that I'm in called Simulating Extreme Space Times, or the SXS collaboration. And the work on this code uh, has primarily been at Caltech, Cornell, and CETA, where I, I currently am right now. Um, you can find more inf information about our code on blackholes.org slash spec. As the name implies, uh, the spectral Einstein code uses spectral methods. And this, these are different from the more traditional finite difference methods. So in spectral methods, we expand the solution we want to solve for, let's call it u of tx, in terms of known basis functions. Here, they're big phi. And what we solve for are the expansion coefficients, u tilde. And because we know uh, these basis functions exactly, we can compute derivatives of our solution, u, ex exactly as well. So. Because of this nice property, it, um, it, can, it can be shown that if our solution is smooth, then this gives this method, spectral methods, give exponential convergence. If you increase your numerical resolution, the error in your solution goes down exponentially. And uh, this is, turns out to be rather well suited for the problem of finding black holes. And in addition, uh, our spectral Einstein code uh, allows use of uh, flexible computational domain geometries that can adapt to the physical problem we're dealing with, and also involves a technique called black hole excision. Um, but to explain this, uh, it's probably easier to do with a picture. So here's a picture of the merger of two black holes where the big black hole is eight times bigger than the smaller black hole. And this is a, one of the simulations that 
uh, our collaboration has done. The green surface here is the horizon of the bigger black hole. The red surface is the horizon of the smaller black hole. And if you look at this green surface, it's, trans it's a bit transparent, so you can look inside. And you can see that inside of it, there's a part of the computational domain that's been cut away. And that's because these, inside of these black holes, there are space-time singularities. And if we were to keep them on our computational grid, that would definitely give us problems. So we cut it out. We cut it out of our computational domain. And we cut in the boundary, uh, it's called the excision boundary, and cutting this out is called black hole excision. And this excision boundary is inside the horizon because anything we do inside of a black hole horizon doesn't affect physics outside of a black hole horizon. So it won't affect any of the physics outside of the horizon that we're interested in. And um, if you look closely, I hope you can also see that there's a gray surface surrounding both of these two individual horizons. And that is the horizon of the final bigger black hole uh, that forms when these two individual black holes collide with each other. So, and, um, so, so in this calculation, you don't have any mapping. You only right. have singularity. That's purely mapping. OK. And the second question is that in your spectrometer, you have a special dependence on uh, of this uh, expansion, uh, the basis. How do you choose it? So we choose, um, like for the radial direction, we choose them called uh, Chebyshev polynomials. Uh -huh. And maybe granular directions, you can choose spherical harmonics. I see. Right, so we use different basis functions in different spatial directions. Uh -huh. okay. <coughs> and so here's a, a short summary of recent progress in the in numerical relativity, uh, specific to binary black hole simulation. So the first ever successful simulation of an orbit plus merger of binary black holes was achieved in 2005. So this is this was the problem extends much earlier to much earlier than 2005, but it was only until 2005 that the first one worked. And this was done by Franz Pretorius, who was a postdoc at Caltech, and he's now a professor at Princeton. And quickly after Pretorius succeeded, um, his work was followed by uh, work um, by the groups at NASA Godard and Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, University of Vienna, and the Albert Einstein Institute. But these last two are in Germany. <coughs> and all these first successful attempts they uh, only had a few orbits. They certainly were impressive, um, but they only had a few orbits before merger. And so they only uh, had a few gravitational wave cycles, which is typically too short to be useful um, for gravitational wave uh, observatories. Finally, though, so I entered graduate, um, graduate school at Caltech in 2006, and the first project that I was given was to use a spectral Einstein code to simulate the merger of um, binary black holes. So before then, um, we were not able to get mergers with our code yet. So that was my first problem. And I worked on that for a few years. And finally, in 2009, we succeeded. And because we used the spectral method, unlike finite difference methods that all these other groups have used, it allowed, it allowed us to produce the longest accurate in spiral, uh, which was 16 orbits, plus the merge and ring down. So it was the longest and most accurate at that time. Um, although it was for equal mass and non spinning black holes. So essentially the simplest case of binary black holes. And I said at that time they were the longest and most accurate because um, now they're not, because now we've outdone this. Um, use even longer and more accurate things. But since this initial success, our goal has been to extend, extend the parameter space coverage of our binary black hole simulation, <coughs> while of course uh, maintaining these goals of length of our simulation and their accuracy. Just uh, for the re uh, reality, 
what people expect, uh, how many audits. Uh, so the 16 month lab, or you have to go 100, or maybe the five, five years of lab. So right. what, what is the expected? Uh, so it depends on um, the mass ratio of the black hole, because mm -hmm. so detectors like LIGO, they have a frequency band in which they're sensitive to. Yeah, but, but then that, that's uh, the, the equipment is uh, sensitive. But then in our so two black holes that they are spiraling around, and then finally they merge. How many objects are there? They will merge. Um, so it also is uh, physically related to mass ratio. So more extreme mass ratios um, typically have to undergo uh, more orbits before they can merge. And um, the exact number of you know, astrophysically, how, how many. Um, for a typical binary black hole that, that might exist, how many orbits it actually undergoes in its lifetime, um, I'm, I'm not sure what that answer is. So I think you have a simulation, you cannot do this uh, type of uh, analysis? So in our simulation, in principle, we can simulate as many orbits as we want by putting the black hole initially as far away as we want. right? Um, but it just is more expensive to do because Increases the size of our computational domain, and the farther away the black holes are, the in-spiral rate is slower. And so these these factors just make the simulation as a whole much longer and more expensive. But in principle, it's it's, it's doable. Um, I think the question right. here is uh, how many orbits do you, uh, is are relevant. So there has been uh, some, uh, so, so for um, high mass ratios, for high mass ratios, like a mass ratio of 10 to 1, um, perhaps about uh, 20 orbits are enough. Perhaps about 20 orbits are enough. But that is related to the, the sensitivity of the frequency band of, of LIGO, though. Mm -hmm. Because um, for higher mass ratios, um, the merger occurs at a higher frequency. And uh, LIGO is only sensitive to, to some maximum frequency. Um, and if you go backwards to lower frequency, that only covers a certain number of orbits <coughs> for that binary band. <coughs> okay. I, I hope that ex explained it, but if not, it's yeah. not. But I, I think one can estimate that because uh, if you daytime is four kilometers and the black hole size is about one kilometer. So uh, when as soon as they uh, <coughs> they uh, about they are about to merge, the wave wavelength is also about one kilometer also. It's on this order. So, so LIGO is aiming for the almost the last orbit. The last few. Uh, I few think that's that's time. true yeah. um, because that's also where the signal is strongest. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So suppose the 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 measurable gravitational wave mm -hmm. uh, reach the Earth. Right. So what effect of uh, gravitational wave will do uh, to the normal people? It's so weak that for normal objects, um, you won't notice anything in, in, in daily life. For, I mean, it's, it's so weak that just for LIGO, in order to detect changes in the arm lengths, it, it needs to be extremely isolated. And that's, that's part of the difficulty. So um, our first successful binary black hole simulation was for equal mass non-spinning holes. And shortly after this work, um, I took the lead to extend a simulation to spinning black holes. And in our first cases, the spins of the black holes, so I call the black hole spin chi, 